I'm sure that many of you have heard the uh, Yeats poem, The Second Coming, which includes the famous overquoted line, uh, the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. The best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And we're always complaining about this, right? We're always complaining the left always wins and they're always on the march and the right never fights back. And why don't we learn to fight and Republicans are useless? And why is an evil ignoramus like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez so clearly energized while Mitch McConnell talks like this, you know? So why does that happen? Why does it happen so often that we feel that the left is on the march and we are kind of just fuddling around trying to play defense all the time? Now, for one thing, I've I've talked about this before, but one thing is we are asking politicians to do the difficult thing, uh, which is to build freedom by taking less power from themselves. That's not what politicians normally do. It's not what government normally does. Government, it's the norm for government to grow. It's the norm for people to be, uh, to lose power, to lose their liberty, uh, and to slowly be taken over by government. So, you know, conservatives are trying, always trying to climb uphill. We're fighting an uphill battle uh, while leftists are kind of surfing downstream. They're in the rapids going downstream. Oh, rot and, you know, government uh, taking over all the power. Uh, That's just perfect. We'll just float right down to that. And I've always said this, you know, that socialism, leftism is a form of decay. And so we are like doctors trying to keep that decay at bay, knowing that everything made by mortal hands will die and everything that lives will die. And freedom, liberty is a living thing, whereas tyranny is just the norm. It's just that kind of, you know, when things flatline, when somebody dies and the meter suddenly goes beep, you know, that's that's what socialism is. Socialism is the norm of death. It's life is something that you work for. Death is something that happens to you, uh, whether you like it or not. And that's the reason we're always kind of uh, working uphill. But the mechanism by which decay and death come to a country is almost always connected to the disease of self-deception, a tendency uh, to tell ourselves things that make us feel good about the world or that make us feel that there are more possibilities in the world than there are, but that are just simply not true. When you're building a society, when you're building a civilization, you're kind of inoculated against self-deception because necessity is everywhere, right? You can't pretend that all family arrangements are equal uh, when you're struggling for your life. There's only It's only one family arrangement that actually works when you're doing that, or you can't pretend that the world owes you a living. You know, I have a, I have a right to health care. I have a right to health care. You know, you're li- when you're just lucky, you don't have an arrow in your forehead. You know, that's, you know, I have a right not to have an arrow in my, you know, it just doesn't work. When necessity is all around you, you can't tell yourself all these lies. You can't parade as if the world, uh, you know, like everybody's equal or someone isn't the strongest or someone isn't the best. You can't uh, give participation trophies when you're fighting for your life. But once a civilization becomes rich and happy, it's lying. Hooray. It's lying time. Lying time has come, you know, and what the left has learned to do is they've learned to hide their positive lies behind negative half truths. And what I mean by that is this is the whole basis of critical theory, right? It's whether it's critical race theory or critical gender theory or critical, whatever theory it is, it's always critical. It's always criticizing things. And of course, you can always criticize everything. Everything's imperfect. Everything's unfair. Everything uh, has, has flaws and is not what it should be. So you can criticize everything, but the minute they start talking about what their uh, actual philosophy is, what their positive assertions are, then the lies come out. And that's when they get caught. That's why they're trying to pretend that critical race theory isn't what they say it is, because they actually got caught teaching something uh, that's more than criticism, that's not just criticism, that actually is an attack. It's racism. It's just racism. And so they get caught on that. I want to read to you, so what I want to look at for a, for a couple of minutes is I want to look at the underlying assumptions of the left's criticisms. What are the underlying assumptions of the left criticisms, and what is the what is the lie that's hidden in those underlying assumptions? I want to read you something from C.S. Lewis, obviously the great Christian apologist of the last century, uh, a man who really defended the, the Christian soul of the West uh, during World War II uh, and went on to just really just unpack a lot of Christian, basic Christian theology in just a, an incredibly clear way a, with a clarity that amounted to genius. And he wrote a famous book called, called The Screwtape Letters. For those of you who haven't re- read it, I recommend it highly. It takes about 40 minutes to read. And it's a series of letters from a senior demon, uh, Screwtape, to, who is trying to educate 
a junior demon on how to steal people's souls. And that was written during the height of World War II, around 1942. Uh, But in 1959, during the height of the Cold War, Lewis published a sequel called Screwtape Proposes a Toast. And this is Screwtape getting up and making kind of after-dinner speech uh, about how to steal souls en masse, how to ruin societies en masse. And it's really an attack uh, on the educational system and how C.S. Lewis thought communism Uh, was working its way into the West through the educational system. And so he's talking, this this is a demon talking about how to ruin civilization. And he's teaching younger demons what they want to do. And this is what he says. It's a a lengthy little passage, but I've condensed it as much as I could. He says, democracy is the word with which you must lead them by the nose. It's a word they venerate. And of course, it's connected with the political ideal that men should be equally treated. You then make a stealthy transition in their minds from this political ideal to a factual belief that all men are equal. As a result, you can use the word democracy to sanction, in his thought, the most degrading of all human feeling. The feeling I mean is, of course, that feeling which prompts a man to say, I'm as good as you. No man who says, I'm as good as you, believes it. He would not say it if he did. The St. Bernard never says it to the toy dog, nor the scholar to the dunce, nor the employable to the bum, nor the pretty woman to the plain. The claim to equality outside the strictly political field is made only by those who feel themselves to be in some way inferior. Sounds like Pride Month, right? And when people say they're proud, it's because they're not. C.S. Lewis goes on. He says he therefore resents the man that we're trying to corrupt therefore resents every kind of superiority in others. He denigrates it. He wishes its annihilation. Presently, he suspects every mere difference of being a claim to superiority. Now, this useful phenomenon is by no means new. Under the name of envy, it has been known to the humans for thousands of years. Under the influence of envy, those who are in any way or every way inferior can labor more wholeheartedly and successfully than ever before to pull down everyone else to their own level. What I want, Screwtape says to the young demons, he says, what I want to fix your attention on is the vast overall movement towards the discrediting and finally the elimination of every kind of human excellence, moral, cultural, social, or intellectual. And I read this, obviously, it just seems to me to be a perfect description of what is happening today, what the left is doing now. If there's inequity, it's because of bigotry. It can't be because somebody is working harder or because people's lifestyles are bringing them down. It must be because there's bigotry. If you criticize my sexual lifestyle, uh, you're a bigot. It couldn't be because maybe there are some good ways to have uh, sexual relations and some bad ways to have sexual relations. And if you think that twerking or violent rap or globalism uh, are bad, it must be because of the race of the person pushing them. If you don't like globalism, it's because George Soros is a Jew. If you don't like twerking, it's because uh, a black artist is doing that. Cardi B is doing it. So you must be racist. It couldn't possibly be because nation states are better. It couldn't possibly be because twerking is degrading. And what's fascinating about this is in order to defend this attack on excellence, and that's what it is, it's It's an attack on excellence, the left has to come up with this horrifically racist idea, this racist and, and sexist idea, that the things that aren't working in a, in a culture are actually belong to that culture. So they'll say things like uh, black communities uh, are in dysfunction because of um, single parenthood, because of uh, the, because fathers don't stay in the home. And they'll say, well, that's black culture. You can't criticize. But what are you, racist? But there's nothing black about that culture. That wasn't always true. That's a result of policy. It happens to be the result of Democrat policy that, f- that paid people to have children out of wedlock. Or if you say that uh, you, you know, you should use good grammar. They say good grammar. That's racist. You know, black people can't use good grammar. They, they have their own grammar. That, it's absurd, right? It's absurd. Grammar is an agreed upon thing in a civilization. It changes over time. But a civilization, a society has a grammar so that we can communicate clearly. And good grammar is a, a way of communicating cre- clearly. Uh, they, they've even said that, uh, you know, black people can't uh, learn math because the idea of a right answer is a white concept. Objectivity is a white concept. Can- Concept. Here's a K through 12 New York teacher, a New York teacher who teaches K through 12, talking about how you have to teach black people. It's cut 20. 
Black people, we are relational people. Mm-hmm. We are people of context. Like it's very Western and European to to dissect and analyze and take apart things. Whereas mm. Afrocentric schooling or Afrocentric spirituality or African epistemology or ways of knowing, everything is connected. So this is why education is not working for so many students of color because we are context driven people. It couldn't be because the teachers won't go back to work. It couldn't be because their progressive means of education don't work for anybody but a white, uh, a wealthy family, never mind a white family, just a wealthy family with parents in the home can correct what the teachers are doing in school. It couldn't be any of those things. It must be because it's black culture not to think clearly. That's absurd. It is absolutely absurd. But it's just an attack on excellence. This is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. It is an attempt to wear down using the idea of democracy, but not the truth about democracy, uh, to make people feel, hey, anybody who's better than me must be doing something wrong. You saw this with the rioters after George Floyd's death, uh, the mostly peaceful rioters who destroyed city upon city, uh, who tore down statues of truly great men like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Christopher Columbus, really interesting, exciting men who made the world better and made the world more expansive. And then they erect statues to who? To George Floyd, a career criminal. What does that say to people? You know, because his skin is black, that makes him a representative of black people. They don't want to build a statue just, oh, maybe Clarence Thomas or maybe Frederick Douglass or maybe, uh, you know, Thomas Sowell. No, you're going to build him to George Floyd because then you don't have that problem of excellence. And and then, of course, you know, the George Floyd statue was uh, desecrated and everybody's, this is horrifying. Although it wasn't horrifying when they were desecrating the statues of great people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. The charge of racism, to some degree, is really just a manifestation of way of getting to this place where they are attacking excellence and and basically saying that excellence is a white thing. We're not going to practice excellence. It's not fair. It's not fair. That's your white, white privilege. But it's wrong. It's not true. Anyone can be excellent, but they have to follow certain paths to get to that excellence, the hard path. It's about behavior. The underlying assumption to this, right, is that if we take away all these differences, if we take away difference, just like C.S. Lewis said, then we're all going to be wonderful. We're all going to be wonderful. It's the idea that we want to have a democracy because we're all so wonderful that we should each have a say. We should each have an equal say. But that's not why we believe in democracy. We believe in democracy because we believe that we're all so corruptible. Every single one of us is so corruptible that none of us, none of us should have that much power. That, that's the true equality that people have. We're all corruptible. Just about every one of us is corruptible. Power corrupts everybody. So we want to spread the power around. What they are doing is they're looking for a way to bring the power together. They want to get those power centers in their hands, and they do it by saying, look at the unfairness, look at the unfairness. But the underlying assumption of, of the criticism is that they know something better. They can do something better. And when you start to examine what that better is, it is always consolidating power in their hands. The same thing is true with sexuality. It's not just race. It's not, you know, there was a, a an article in the Washington Post. Lauren Rowello wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post celebrating the, fesh, the fetishism of gay pride parades, right? And she says, oh yeah, I want to take my kid, my kids to see this. I want them to know. And she says, she says, a bare-chested man whose black suspenders clipped into a leather thong, paused to be spanked playfully by a partner with a flog. And she wanted her children to see this because they were celebrating who they were. I should mention, by the way, that Lauren Roello's husband uh, is now her wife. Uh, He transitioned. Uh, I assume he has his genitals removed and was uh, given estrogen. He must have transitioned from a Republican to a Democrat. Uh, but she's, so she's obviously no, no great defender of, uh, you know, sexual sanity, right? So she's teaching her kids this. But what is the, what is the underlying assumption? She actually says it, that this is who you are. If you want to be spanked by your partner, this is who you are. And I, I want to address that for a minute, okay? Because obviously nobody cares what people enjoy in the bedroom. If you do it behind closed doors, it's, it's absolutely nobody's business. But the thing about a fetish 
right? A fetish is the inability, the inability to have sex unless you have some totem uh, or some behavior going on. And almost always, I believe, a fetish is caused by trauma in your life, in your past. So if you were beaten in your past, you may have now confused love with pain, uh, and you now have a fetish for pain, and you can't have sex unless you have pain. So wh- so what's, what's wrong with that? Well, it's not like, oh, it's a sin, you're going to hell, God doesn't like it. That's not the point. The point is, it, it actually is, instead of using sex for its purpose, which is the purpose of connection and creation, that's what sex is for, it is co- to connect with the opposite, is to create babies, so it's therefore to connect with the opposite sex and and uh, develop a, uh, a an intimacy and love that you don't have with anybody else. And so you say to me, well, I want to connect with my own sex. Okay, all right. But if you say you want to have this fetish, in your life, what you're doing is instead of doing that, you're just re- you're just repeating the trauma of the past. That's what a fetish is. I think it's a, rep- a repetitive trauma. So you're actually going back into the worst part of your past and living it over again. And I don't think that is the healthiest way to have sex. I'm, I'm not even saying you can cure it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm simply saying you should understand you have a disorder. It's a disorder. It's a it's a it's not who you are. And who you are may have nothing to do with that. Who you are may be so much better than that. And yet, okay, you're pinned with this fetish, and that's the only way. You can have sex. Again, it's not a judgment on you. It's not a judgment on you because that's not who you are. So the, the underlying assumption here is that you are just this piece of meat and what that piece of meat wants or doesn't want is what defines you. And that is utterly ridiculous, the, that we are defined by our desires. Uh, and our underlying assumption is, is quite different. The underlying assumption of the right, the positive assertion of the right, is that we are defined uh, by our relationship with our creator uh, that we are that really is even though even people on the right who say they're atheists actually believe this that we are defined with our relationship and what we were made uh, with what we are made to be and that relationship is always lacking we're not never quite what we were made to be all of us know this all of us know that there is a better version of ourselves that we are aspiring to and we aspire to that and sometimes aspiring to that means setting your desires aside or rising above your desires sometimes uh, it means denying yourself your desires and and sometimes it means uh, keeping things private that have to be private because if you're parading your fetish around it means you're ashamed of it you're just trying to pretend that you're uh, proud of it the, I, the point that I'm trying to make about this, though, is these are our underlying assumptions. Our underlying assumptions are difficult. They are unpleasant. They're ideas that you are corrupted by power. They're ideas that power, uh, that there is no system that is going to change you. And therefore, the best thing to do is to leave you, uh, let you handle your life alone and be responsible. That's a hard idea. It's a difficult idea. The, the idea that your uh, desires define you. And therefore, no one should be able to criticize your desires and you should not criticize your desires. And yeah, it was great that I wound up in a men's room and then was beaten up and was mugged. You know, I was just following. That's who I am, man. You know, I mean, that's easy. It is all so easy. Why? Because it is heading downward into entropy and death. So the easy path is always the path uh, of of decay. It always is the path of decay. Life is always this energetic thing. So when we look at things and we say, why is it? Why is it that the uh, the, the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity, it's because the worst are doing the easy thing. Of course, they're passionately intense about it, while the best, the best people are striving towards something, and it's hard, and it's hard, and it's doubly hard when you live in a society that doesn't appreciate it. That the culture that created Mozart and Shakespeare and Jefferson and uh, Isaac Newton is not better than a culture that creates blankets and pots, that never gets out of its huts, that never rises above uh, primitivism. Because that's, uh, you know, because it's undemocratic to say so. It's undemocratic to say that Mozart and Shakespeare and Jefferson and Newton and the Constitution and science are better, are better than primitivism. That's undemocratic, that's cruel, that's racist, that's not fair. It is an absurdity that means essentially you have to stay in mediocrity and primitivism forever, lest ye be uh, an insult to those who don't have those things. Instead, instead to say, oh, let me let me look at this and aspire to that. Let me try and be that. Let, even if I can't be excellent, let me look at the excellence uh, and become better in myself. That's an effort. That's a hard thing to do. You know, every now and again, I like to play this uh, cartoon that was made right after the war called Make Mine Freedom. 
1948, uh, and it was an anti-communist cartoon, and it shows all the different factions in American life, the workers fighting with the bosses and the farmers fighting with the politicians, and everybody's fighting with each other, and it's all chaos. It's the chaos of freedom, but along comes a snake oil salesman, and he has something to sell. This is cut 15. Hurry, 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 step right up, folks. Here's the answer to your problems, Dr. Utopia's sensational new discovery, ISM. ISM will cure any ailment of the body politic. It's terrific, it's tremendous. Once you swallow the contents of this bottle, you'll have the bountiful benefit of higher wages, shorter hours, and security. Enormous profits, no strikes. Remember, you're the big boss. Government control, no worry about votes, name your own salary, bigger crops, lower costs. Why, ism even makes the weather perfect every day. So he says, he says, no, right now, this special offer, we're giving this away free. All you have to do is sign this contract. And here's the contract. I hereby turn over to ism incorporated everything I have, including my freedom and the freedom of my children and my children's children in return for which said ism promises to take care of me forever. <laughs> so the idea that freedom and all the benefits of equal treatment under the law come arise from a culture of excellence and arise from the excellences of that culture, uh, that, that those are the things we have to have before we become free, before we become scientific, before we become wise. The restrictions, what happens is the restrictions on government that we put on government because we've learned these things, create a government that seems like a good thing and create the ultimate fantasy of the left, that there is such a thing as government, this, this kind of amorphous power that is going to do benevolent things to you. There is no such thing as, as the state or government. There are only people, there's only people with power. And if you don't control those people with power, they will just start to convince you that they should have all the power. It is excellence, it's thought, it's reason, it's objectivity, it's good grammar, it's all those little things that we do that are excellent, that keep people free and give you the things that you want, that you actually want. And they fade away when you start stop practicing excellence only to prove what is simply is not true, that you're as good as the next guy. None of us is that good, but some people are excellent in some things, and those are the people we should hold up and follow and so that we can become, if not excellent, at least free. <laughs>